morning. Okay, this is what I was afraid that uh, the first first talk in the morning. <laughs> but <clears throat> uh, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to give an update on uh, open networking and uh, related activities uh, that we do uh, with Onos and uh, in uh, in the open networking space. So. Um, I think SKT has been involved with the Onos project from very, very early on. Uh, we liked the idea that uh, Onos was uh, singly uh, focused on carrier grade SDN problem, and uh, they, want, they had a very clean architecture, uh, which I think uh, has, uh, has a very good uh, 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 driving force behind it because it has a very simple interface and there are lots of uh, uh, options for other developers to contribute and uh, uh, make modules. So, uh, okay, I didn't get the clicker. Uh, let me get it. <clears throat> yeah, I was imagining for a, for a second that somehow magically we will <laughs> go to the next. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so, um, if you are from Korea, I mean, you wrote already SKT is a household name. Uh, if you're not, uh, still, it's, a, it's a one of the most advanced telcos uh, in the world, in my opinion, and that's one of the reasons why I joined SKT when I uh, came to Korea uh, three years ago. It has many firsts uh, in the world, in its history, and uh, right now everybody's talking about the next generation mobile network service, which is 5G. Um, because it's the fifth generation. Now, <clears throat> a 5G network is going to be a faster and it's a quicker response, uh, the responsive network with the massive connectivity and so on. Uh, what SKT's thinking is that, I mean, right now we use networks for many things like watching videos, uh, uh, checking your uh, friends on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, playing online games and so on. And that is already driving a lot of interesting use case. And uh, it is definitely a different kind of network than the original cellular network where the major application was voice and text, right? So um, some people ask, I mean, so what's new for 5G, right? Looks like we already have something good enough, at least in Korea. So uh, when I uh, have a business travel to US, I want to hang myself, I mean, that, uh, the phone doesn't work uh, in the elevator, for example, or a parking garage. But we don't have that problem. So actually many people ask, I mean, hey, I mean, in Korea we have pretty good network already, so why do we need any other uh, new network? Because it, it means a lot of investment and also there are lots of technical challenges from physical layer to all the way to the top. And um, so these are things that we feel at SKT that is not uh, can be cannot be uh, well supported by the current LTE network. So one is like I mean providing this uh, uh, rich assistance, which requires seamless uh, 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 experience to the user. Um, something more important importantly uh, is this uh, something. Uh, more mission critical. So right now, uh, LTE network is uh, so-called best effort, right? Uh, best effort is a very misleading word, uh, in my opinion, because best effort means that if it doesn't work, uh, okay, uh, sorry, <laughs> we cannot do anything more, right? It's not really best effort. It's not best in any any uh, any any way, but it's a that's I mean that's how it, it is termed. Uh, another thing is um, new experience, like uh, more immersive media, like VR, AR. Now, companies like Apple and Facebook, they are coming up with new AR capabilities on the phone, right? So, uh, I think that's a start. And uh, if, you, if you see, if you look back, how much we have come uh, from 10 years ago to now, uh, it's, uh, it's fairly amazing. I mean, uh, what, what can happen in the next 10 years, right? And 
And uh, we don't think that the current network is capable of handling all that. We have about, <clears throat> in Korea, uh, average mobile users, they uh, consume uh, 7, gigabit, uh, 7 gigabytes per month. So that is already pretty substantial. And uh, I mean, if we go by all these uh, predictions from the research firms like Gartner, that data is growing exponentially, they have to travel through networks, right? So, so that is a fairly big challenge. So, uh, of course, there are all those things that need to happen, like optical fiber needs to be able to carry more bits and uh, the wireless area, uh, the antennas, they need to be able to uh, use all this spectrum that, um, uh, to uh, make it efficient to deliver bits, right? But that's not all, in our opinion, uh, because the reason is that uh, we don't know what the killer apps for the 5G yet. I mean, when we uh, looked at LTE, okay, uh, people had some idea, okay, video is going to be big, and obviously it has become a big uh, data consumer. Now, for 5G, we had these ideas like, okay, AR, VR, of course, they drive a lot of data and uh, self-driving cars. I mean, uh, people are talking about they will, these cars will generate petabytes of data every day. Uh, I mean, we don't think that all those data are useful to transmit over the network because it's, uh, I mean, everything is cost-benefit kind of stuff. But one thing is that network needs to be more intelligent so that, okay, some of the bits, it doesn't need to uh, carry, right? Some of the things can be done much better uh, in the local area. And uh, some of the things, uh, they need to actually, I mean, uh, give uh, better priority and uh, 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 more guarantee kind of stuff. So it becomes very quickly, very complicated. So, so that is the thing. One is that the future is uncertain. We don't know what we are designing the network for. So that's a very fundamental problem. The second thing is that um, when we know, uh, we need to be able to quickly respond to that uh, demand. And the third thing is that it will be different kinds of applications. So a lot of things will depend on the 5G infrastructure, for example, uh, mission critical service like AI, connected car versus uh, VR entertainment kind of thing it has a very different characteristics versus uh, IoT and IoT also is a very broad term right so my Apple watch can be IoT versus some very huge industrial robot uh, that is working in the shipyard can be IoT also so they all have very different requirements and the expectations from the network so unless we design it very carefully and in a way that it can be composed and flexible, uh, it's going to take a lot of effort and uh, resources to fix it later. So, um, so one thing that is for sure is that it has to be an open architecture. So at SKT, we have this uh, uh, three-layer K uh, network that we have designed. So in the bottom layer is something called Cosmos, which is what I'm going to talk about mainly today, is basically the, the layer that takes care of uh, hardware like servers and network switches and storage uh, with the software functions. Like uh, in the Etsy term, it's called Virtual Infrastructure Manager. Basically, all the things that uh, are uh, required to run the data center. And on top of that, we have a layer called at scale, uh, which is basically looking more of a uh, telco functions. Like, I mean, how do you do handoff? How do you do billing and metering? And how do you make sure you find your uh, party that you want to reach kind of stuff? And then on top of that, we want to build all these uh, different kind, kinds of services. So essentially the networking part is those two layers, Cosmos layer and SKL layer. Okay, 
So Cosmos is a is a is an acronym. Uh, so uh, we wanted to uh, express our uh, desire uh, in this acronym. So it, it means composable, open, scalable, obvious, right? And uh, it can be also it can support uh, mission critical systems. So that's what M stands for. So <clears throat> it has uh, these. Uh, layers where you have physical resources, server network storage, and now GPUs. Uh, they're very up-to-date, as, as you can see. Uh, and uh, then virtual resources, basically the software to define and carve out the resources that you need, and then provide to the upper layer. Uh, for the physical resources, we are actively engaged with uh, open hardware activities like OCP, for the open software part, we are working with OpenStack, Onos, Cord. So that's uh, how uh, we are doing. And the third part is this operation part. So we should be able to operate all these uh, resources, track them, manage them uh, in a way that is uh, less uh, burdensome to the operators. So I'm going to give you a slice of I mean, those uh, bits and pieces of information. So <clears throat> these are actually our project names. You don't have to remember them. But uh, uh, so one thing is Sona, and uh, this is the network virtualization layer. I think uh, there was a Sona uh, technical talk yesterday, very in depth, what we are doing with Onos and uh, how it uh, works with OpenStack. And uh, so that is taking care of the virtual network management. And uh, the lib spine control is done through Sona Fabric. And uh, this is the networking part, but overall infrastructure management is done through something called TACO. I'm going to give you a little bit of I mean, uh, uh, information about that because it's not covered yesterday. And uh, network monitoring is another area that, uh, like I said, it's, uh, uh, we are focused on. So TACO is, of course, something we love to eat, but uh, in SKT, we have a project called TACO. And this is basically a containerized version of OpenStack. And um, uh, what we are trying to do is that it used to be the case that we got these uh, vendor-delivered OpenStacks. And uh, this is the, uh, the case for many large uh, corporate there are companies like Red Hat, HP, Mirantis, Canonical, they provide OpenStack and support, right? So uh, uh, we also were operating in that model. So uh, we got support from the vendor. Uh, we have our OpenStack uh, uh, installed and deployed in our infrastructure. But I mean, there is uh, good parts in that, but there are also bad parts in that because uh, we cannot do everything as we want. So we decided to take a leap and uh, take a risk and uh, develop our own OpenStack release and uh, uh, synchronize with the community version. So we can be more up to date and uh, we can have more of the control to ourselves. Uh, initially it was, I mean, we were not sure whether we can do that or not, but uh, it turned out looks like it's something that we can do. So we are exploring this path. Uh, it is also, um, I mean, we could do that because many of the technologies are coming together to help us to, to be able to achieve that. So, so for example, uh, so container uh, technologies are more mature and in the OpenStack project also, they have containerization effort so that it is easier to manage OpenStack. Yeah. Because it, it has so many projects, so it's, uh, it, it, it is actually uh, probably not a good idea to do everything manual, but once you have con uh, containerization and configuration automated, that some of these things can be done. So we are doing it. Uh, we have this is a, uh, this is an internal process, very uh, simple version of it, 
And the one thing is that, so we get OpenStack source code, uh, we get Kubernetes source code, and we also get Sona. Sona is our network virtualization project uh, built on top of Monos. And uh, uh, do the testing. So automate a lot of these parts uh, from pulling, testing, and uh, checking, and deploying, and uh, then running. So, so, so that has uh, been working so far. Uh, it has not been fully deployed yet. We are still testing in, uh, in SKT. But I think something like this is very important going forward. The, oops, the format got messed up while converting, looks like. The, the, the main network virtualization part is Sona, and this is the um, project that we have been developing with Ono's folks for a while. And uh, basically, Sona is, uh, in our opinion, a better backend for a neutron interface. And uh, it provides virtual network management uh, easily. Uh, it can configure uh, your uh, uh, virtual network uh, configurations and uh, then controls the connectivity. Uh, it is much scalable. Uh, it is uh, also compatible with OpenStack, almost. So if you are interested in it, we, we would be more than happy to uh, help you to deploy Sona in your environment. Um, there are lots of updates. Uh, so Sona Fabric and uh, running NFTs like uh, LD as a service and the firewall as a service on top of XOS, but I'm not going to detail. Uh, uh, I don't think this is the right forum for that, but uh, you can always uh, grab our people and uh, you can see the demo. So another thing is this uh, flow tracer that we built on top of uh, Ono's uh, GUI interface to see, I mean, if there's uh, something that you want to troubleshoot, uh, instead of going through each links, you can visualize uh, how they work. So yeah, I mean, we have a demo booth outside, so you can uh, find them out. Another thing is uh, something called Tina, and this is a network analyzer. And what we are trying to do is to analyze the network traffic at multiple layers, from packet layer to the session layer, uh, without having to go through the uh, different tools uh, this is a solution where it is already deployed in our network, and it is uh, this is a little bit of old GUI, but it looks something like this, and it gives you a I mean high level overview and the capability to drill down. So if you see okay some patterns that, or if you want to understand okay what is the network behavior for certain service, then you can drill down and see more uh, of that uh, session. Uh, one thing that's nice is that it doesn't just uh, give you packet level or just the session level uh, information, it also gives you the uh, protocol level information as well. So for TCP sessions, uh, it gives you all the statistics about TCP. So you can, you can get this information without having to use another tool. So this, is, this has been uh, used a lot. Um, and uh, to support all this, we have developed something called FlowX, and this is a fast uh, packet capture capability. So actually, I mean, we have a lot of traffic that we need to capture and analyze, so this is to, for uh, you to analyze after the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, when you want to look deeper into the, the packet traffic that you want to do. And uh, we're designing it in a way that is scalable, so it can scale out. So it, uh, as you add more, you can just uh, 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 increase the capacity. And eventually, and uh, at this point, I want the AV folks to play the video. Eventually, what we are trying to do is that, uh, so, I mean, the tools that I have shown you uh, uh, before are the web tools. Can you play the video? Yeah. So 
they, they, they are web tools, very traditional. I mean, you have dashboard and you have the bar graph and the, uh, the, the plots. But uh, in the end, what we are trying to do is that, okay, we want to make it more interactive and uh, easier to interact and even, even fun to interact with. So uh, we actually use the game engine uh, called Unity to develop this uh, tool. And uh, basically, this is a depiction of the data center that we have tested. So these are the actual test bed uh, that we are pulling information from. And all these uh, uh, tall towers are racks. And uh, these racks, I mean, you can also go into deeper. And uh, there is a rack with uh, a red color. And uh, there is some flame coming up. And uh, that is basically showing that there is some problem. So somehow this operator is looking into something here. So that's a, a TOR switch with the link uh, to the servers down. And there is also a, a physical representation of the switch with the port and that uh, GUI shows which port is connected, which port is alive uh, type of information. And this is a host information. And you can imagine that uh, this type of GUI can be I mean, developed further to give all the information about your physical uh, data set center environment. I mean, you can imagine, uh, so in the beginning, we showed the, the entire map of Korea and uh, all the data center site. Uh, what we are, eventually what we wanted to do is to have all the network infrastructure uh, from base station uh, to the base data center. We want to be able to visualize and control from it. Uh, this is a different view. This is called the logical view. So. The previous one was a physical view with the physical racks and things like that. This is, so uh, that has a value, but sometimes you want to see how they are connected logically. So this is like a spread out view and you can easily see how the switch is and the scale is a little bit. We have a lot of work to do, but this is a, uh, basically a proof of concept that we have been developing. And, uh, I'm sure some of you remember, I have shown an earlier version of this before. Uh, and uh, this is actually our third iteration. So uh, what we are doing is that, okay, we build something and try to see if it, feel, it looks and feels are okay or not. If it's not, then we, I mean, iterate. So this is our third or fourth iteration of this uh, concept. And uh, I think it's, uh, getting closer to uh, more being useful. So, um, and this is a view that is actually just uh, showing the, the virtual network. So sometimes even with the logical view, you cannot show all the, I mean, the, the components that you are interested in. So only the components that you are interested in, you can visualize like that and show it and okay, also look at the statistics and uh, what is the vitals and what is the problem. And uh, eventually what we want to integrate is the control. So right now it is mainly focused on the visualization of what it is and uh, how it works, but we want to integrate everything automated. Yep. <clears throat> So this is my last slide, I think, um, or the second to the last slide. So, but in the end, in the end, I mean, we don't want uh, network operators need to do a lot of work. I mean, most of the stuff, it should be able to heal itself, right? Like our body heals from all the, uh, the I mean, uh, uh, illness. So, uh, we are working on some of these concepts like uh, network anomaly detection, uh, machine learning based uh, 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 diagnosis and uh, engineering, and uh, multi layer inspections. Uh, so that's the vision. And only the ones that are critical uh, for human operator to intervene. Uh, so then the tool like the visualization tool, like the previous video will be very useful because anyway, 
we don't want to be able to uh, have to I mean, control all these uh, devices, which will be very many in 5G. So to summarize, uh, open networking is very essential for the 5G uh, network infrastructure. And we have been collaborating with Onos. We have been uh, 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 very close working together with uh, ONF and uh, our uh, collaboration and partnership will continue and um, we have to now I mean look at advanced technologies that can help automate uh, network operations and uh, easier to uh, make it work better so that's the, the next step that we are looking into so that concludes my talk uh, thank you very much and if you have any questions I'll be happy to take it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I thought the video was very impressive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we do have time for one or two questions, so please, William is, ha has a mic that he can hand you. If you do have any questions about this presentation, please. Oh, I'm worried because you always ask hard, hard questions. <laughs> so I'm Guru Parulkar from ONF. So Gangman, great talk. Um, so I want to talk about 5G. There is so much confusion about 5G in the sense that you hear uh, providers <laughs> making announcement that they are going to do 5G deployment or trial in this year or next year and all of that. Yeah. On the other end, uh, 5G is not even defined in terms of what it is, what the... Uh, so what does it mean when people say they are going to do 5G trial? Okay, so uh, first, I, I agree with you, there, there are confusions. Uh, second, that there are many people, many companies are, I mean, saying that they are uh, doing trials. Uh, but 5G is well defined. So uh, what 5G should be is defined. How it will be done is probably being worked on it. What components it should have is being worked on, right? Because it's a, it's a big industry. Uh, so, uh, but uh, when people say 5G trials, I think right now it's mainly focused on this uh, network parameters like bandwidth, how much bandwidth you can achieve over the air, and uh, how uh, fast response time you can achieve, because 5G, um, the, you have to be able to send and receive at greater speed than 20 gigabps over the air. So, I mean, that's what, when people say that, okay, they have done 5G trial. But that is just the radio part, right? That is the radio part, yes. So, but, I mean, telco, being telco, uh, uh, we focus a lot on the network QoS parameter. So, in that sense, there are, these uh, trials are being done because otherwise we would not have the even the end-to-end -end picture, right? So, and the radio part is obviously it's a, it's a, it's it's also a hard engineering problem. So there is nothing to uh, uh, talk little about that. But um, so there are two things that are still there. So one is the standard five G standard is still being worked on. Another thing is the the terminal. So, because it has MIMO and, uh, uh, and multiple antennas, so the, the terminal to support 5G is not small enough. Like, I mean, if you want to have a 5G phone, then you will have to wait longer. If you have a 5G car with uh, the terminal in your trunk, it's already there. In terms of, uh, you know, the, another thing we hear is the slicing for radio network is very critical part of 5G. Yep. And even that is not necessarily defined in terms of, uh, and also with radio, are these going to be, uh, you know, the, there's a whole thing about software defined radio and all of that. So, what does 5G radio mean to you? What does 5G radio mean to me? Uh, or SKT or whatever I mean. <laughs> so uh, this is something that I didn't uh, talk about in the slide, but so we have um, uh, we have a work on uh, software-defined radio access network, 
And basically what we are trying to do is to have on this uh, the, the antenna part and uh, try to separate uh, all the protocol processing and everything and uh, do it in the fast genetic components. So, um, and in that way we want to, so when you said uh, network slicing not being well defined, um, I, I think, uh, I mean, in the, uh, once it comes to the wired part, right, network slicing is not very difficult to define. Warning, but so, <laughs> but uh, basically, I mean, uh, in a lot of the case, it's a, it's a scheduling problem. Uh, how do you, I mean, divide your resources up? And the radio, uh, radio resource is also another yet another resource. So it can be defined, but I mean, how do you control it? And uh, what is the mechanism to do that? I mean, that are, I think it's being worked on. So. Maybe there is uh, no solution that you can go out and buy, but I don't think it's the uh, same thing to say that it's not defined or, uh, yeah. Okay, great, thank you for that question. Uh, one more, please. Yes, let's see. <clears throat> thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. This the work that you presented is in the R and D stage. Uh, it's not deployed yet in the operational environment. If so, when do you plan to do that? Another question that I have is that the operations people, most people, in, even from my experience, they do not like changes. They don't want these uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, hard uh, software oriented. Uh, stuff that uh, they need to learn and get used to. Mm. And how at K SKT uh, do you plan to do that when you try to uh, deploy these things and then get the operators to get used to this? So, thanks for the question. So, um, so some of them are deployed, like Tina is deployed in the network, so, but you know, OpenStack, we're testing uh, we have a vendor version, so this uh, Taco version of OpenStack is not deployed yet. Uh, the 3D virtualization, it's, uh, it's a longer, longer term, but I don't think it's necessarily, I mean, too much in the future. It's uh, something that we can start deploying within SKT network from next year. So, um, so that's that part. The second part is a, it's a fundamental problem. It is a very difficult problem to solve and. You need, um, so not, now different skills, right? It's not a technical skill. You need diplomacy to make it work. So because, um, yeah, I mean, uh, network operations people, they have worked in certain way for many years. And uh, uh, they are very conservative for a good reason, right? So uh, they, they think this network is very holy. It's almost a religion, so it's a, it's very difficult to uh, change the I mean, way how you look at network and uh, okay, it is okay to have these components to run the network in a different way. So it's a, it's a long process, in my opinion, and uh, we'll we'll see. But there are also it's not just the service providers, but also vendors like Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung. They are also providing these options with open networking, open stack, auto space, or ODL based controllers. So, and uh, there are companies like AT&T, they are I mean, publicly saying that they will change by a certain year that they want to change to software based, right? So all those things actually help to make the case, but yes, it doesn't come uh, very easily, so it's a it's a lot of work, and I'm sure you must have experienced in your previous life also. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.